And here is the topic. We just want to open it up very quickly. You know, we're talking about measurement, but what are we really talking about? And this will be very interesting here today when we have all these presentations and Jesper's experience on board. Is it accountability, evidence, validation? What is all part of that? I'm sure we can add to this list here. And yet in the end of the day, we wonder how do we address these issues? And especially how do we then in this radical uh, redesign of measurement cope with success and failure? I will hand it right over to Jesper who has something to say about that. So Jesper, you can take it from there and uh, you will also then go on introducing our speakers. Thank you, uh, Sabine, and uh, thanks everyone for, for being uh, part of this uh, session that uh, actually has been a, a long way coming uh, to some extent. We have been, uh, certainly in our work, have been seeing uh, this challenge of measurement and impact assessment in a way holding back very important efforts that are currently uh, being mobilized around the world, really, both in terms of this uh, increasingly important agenda of supporting and, and driving systems change um, and these cross-cutting agendas like the SDGs, for example, in dealing with those in, in a much more productive way. But we are seeing uh, our measurement practices and management practices sort of holding back some of the approaches that we actually need, that we will have to rely on in terms of future ways of working. And equally, it comes to shifting the practice and culture of organizations. Again, uh, we are seeing established procedures and, and paradigms sort of really holding some of that potential back and I know some of our speakers would certainly would touch on that but that's certainly also my own background or sort of entry into this field my background working amongst other things at, at Mind Lab in the Danish government where I spent a lot of time hearing that the real value of the lab was actually not formalized or formally recognized and that was a lot around to, to sort of, let's say, the, the more culture-based changes, that a lot of how we influenced our partners' ways of working, a lot of how we were influencing the attitudes and the mindsets of public employees and, and so on, while at the same time being measured in terms of success on the amount of workshops we did. So in a way, that sort of frustration of actually not having a language, not having a way of uh, talking about or assessing the real important stuff, the real impact, and, and what could be the longer term, let's say, potential of, for example, having a lab in the government was actually, to a large extent, wasted, I'd say, because of some of these challenges that we're talking about today. So with that, we put in motion a, lo a lot of work on, on impact, particularly around culture change, and that led to uh, this recent collaboration with the UNDP, uh, which I'm happy for Gina to join today and share their work on trying to, amongst other things, develop a new impact model for, for the Accelerator Labs program, which she will, I'm sure she'll talk more about, which is very ambitious. But that was also a bit of a positive excuse to get a learning collective going, focused on the practice of doing differently in this space. So I think we have heard a lot about the need for doing something different. I think at this point, we want to take steps forward and actually hear from some of the people, which we are lucky again to have on this call today, about what does it look like when you actually do, do different and kind of tips, steps forward into um, trying to adopt a new way of measuring in organizations and institutions. So, so with that, I guess uh, the only other thing I'll add is this quote from Tom Lusmore encapsulates in a way, the challenge uh, when you sort of think about it in policy terms, um, what we are also dealing with here is a bit of a challenge around the command and control or the sort of input-output logic of, of organizations, institutions. Um, how can we begin to have learning and improvement at the center of developing policies, assessing policies, supporting policies, and actually establish a new practice around that? What we are also talking about is not just measurement, uh, which is obviously is a big part of it, but it's a, it's a broader culture shift. It's broader transformation of how we document, how we manage things, the perspectives we use, the, the, how we manage and, and apply data, the kinds of indicators and the logics around the indicators that we use, as well as the, so let's say, the overall approach. So there's a lot, obviously, in this topic. We hope to be able to cover that in the next couple of hours and become both aware about what the possibilities are, but also actually also having a bit of a sense of what the future practice can actually look like. 
So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Toby to kick us off and he will be helping us with the initial reframing of this topic and share some of their work from the set of public impact a little bit beyond that, I think, as well. So thank you, Toby, for, for, for joining us and over to you. Thank you very much, Jesper. So I'm going to uh, talk to you about managing innovation processes because I, I challenge myself to write the most boring uh, presentation title that I possibly could. And I think you'll agree I've succeeded with that title. No, but the reason that I would to frame this in terms of managing innovation processes is that the question of measurement for me sits in a larger question about how we do management. And I'm going to talk about how innovation networks have a public management problem and that how that problem is the same problem that's faced by all the public service. Essentially, the complexity breaks the dominant paradigm for how we do public management. But then, and not just doom and gloom, I want to talk about what the alternative for doing public management differently looks like. And I want to kind of finish with this kind of upbeat note that if the current way of doing public management is failing for people, then then we can choose to do it differently. So that's what I'm going to cover today. So let's dive in with this idea that innovation networks have a public management problem. Uh, why do I think that? Well, uh, because um, uh, I was reading the work of uh, one of the excellent co-presenters -pre co today, Gina, and in her blog, she was describing how the very mention of results-based management is significantly problematic for, for innovation people. But kind of describing the, the, the problem that we're facing back in 2019 of that the, there's no alternative yet. So basically, I want to pick up from the blog that uh, Gina wrote in 2019. Um, and so I would say that this is a problem that you share with a range of other public service actors. In it, and that our, our framing of this problem is that complexity breaks new public management. The, the core of this problem is that in complex environments, it is impossible for a person, team or organisation to demonstrate their impact. Right? It's not hard, it's not difficult, doesn't matter what you measure, doesn't matter what fancy mathematical tricks you apply to it, it is impossible in complex environments for a person, team or organisation to demonstrate their impact. Why do we say this? Because let's look at what impact it means. So if you frame impact in terms of, uh, in the way it's often done in terms of outcomes, let's look at the way that an outcome is actually created in the world. So this is a systems map of the outcome of obesity um, produced by public health experts. And what they did was they mapped 108 different factors that lead to the outcome of obesity or not. And they looked at all the relationship between all uh, factors. And so you can see from this systems map that the outcome of obesity is the result of hundreds of different factors all working together in a complex system. So the thing that we call impact, the thing that we call outcomes is actually an emergent property of a complex system. So, and as you, I'm sure you know, in complex systems, you cannot identify the, the particular contribution of a single actor or of anything less than the whole and go, this is your impact on the system. It is impossible. So, and this impossibility is why new public management fails as a paradigm. And there is just a ton of evidence that shows how new public management fails. So the preeminent public management scholar in the world did a 30 year study of what happens when people implement new public management reforms. What do we get when for 30 years? Higher costs and more complaints, right? The essential claims of new public management fail and they fail for everybody, right? And particularly when you dig into that, you can see, understand why this is the case when you dig into some of the key practices of new public management. So target based performance management systems again, systematic review of target based performance management systems found 80 percent, 80 percent of studies find evidence of gaming. So the deliberate manipulation of data, nearly three quarters find evidence of people deliberately lying. Right. The core processes of new public management simply do not work. That's an explanation of, I think, the problem that you share with, a, with the rest of the public service uh, around the, the relationship between measurement and management. But the good news is there is an alternative to results-based measurement. Um, uh, and one of those alternatives uh, has a name called human learning systems. So we published an ebook on this in June this year. And we created this with, by working with about 50 public service organizations all over the world to explore the practice that they're already doing, which is an alternative to new public management. Dig into two elements of that very quickly for you now, centered on this idea of learning. Um, because what we found for this alternative public management approach is that learning is the management strategy. 
for public service. Uh, what do I mean by that? So let's take, for example, the relationship that a public service worker might have with someone who is in chronic pain. If you know the idea of chronic pain, but chronic pain is pain that doesn't have an obvious corresponding physical injury. So there's nothing for doctors to fix around chronic pain. What we found that public service workers do in this situation is that they work with the person that they're serving to understand their particular and unique life as a complex system that is currently producing the outcome of chronic pain. So their life, the patterns of their life as a system currently produce this result we call chronic pain. So they seek to understand that system by, they could ask questions like, oh, do you experience the pain more in the evenings or in the daytime? Do you experience it more at work or at home? Do you experience when you do this motion or this action? Do you experience it when you eat this or that? And so they understand that they, with their, working with that person, they understand their life as a system that currently produces the outcome of chronic pain. And then what they do is they work with that person to co-design a series of experiments and explorations in that person's life um, to see if we can get that person's life to produce a different pattern of results. So you might say, uh, what happens if you try this diet or that diet? What happens if you try engaging with this walking group? Right? What happens if we try these physiotherapy manipulations? Blah, blah, blah. They run that series of experiments and explorations in that person's life. And that those things have a bunch of results. So uh, and then they embed the, the results, both what works and what doesn't in behavioral and structural change around that person's life. And because they're Im embedding those changes in that person's life, that person's life as a system changes. And so they go around the cycle again and again and again and again. And so learning this learning relationship between public service worker and the person that they support becomes the public service practice. So you can see at, from the ground level, learning becomes the management strategy because that is the processes that a public service worker is managing. And then what we found is that that's learning as a management strategy is employed at, at each system scale from a person's life as system through organization system, place as system and country as system. And so at each of these scales, people are operating the same kind of learning cycle. But what, and what happens, we found, is that people create connected learning cycles in pairs at different system scales. So the, at the level of organization system and person's life system, what the organization is doing is running a learning cycle which seeks to learn from and enable the learning cycle at the scale below. So they would ask questions like, how do we learn from all of the cases that uh, our organization is involved with? What patterns do we see from across all of those cases? And what policies do we need to change of ours as a result of those patterns? And they also ask enabling questions. As an organization, what are the maximum caseloads for workers that would enable each person to run that learning relationship? What information systems do we need? What are the staff capabilities that we need to recruit for? And so those are learning cycles that they're running at, at, at the uh, management process in an organization. So they are running a series of experiments to answer those kinds of questions. And so in this, the what we have seen is the purpose of management changes from management for control to management for learning. And so in this framing, you have three primary roles as a manager. You create a healthy learning system at the scale at which you're operating. You learn from the patterns of the scale below and you enable that learning cycle at the scale below. And as I'm sure you will recognize by now, all of these are themselves processes of innovation and experimentation. So I wanna just finish by saying you have a choice about how to do management. I don't accept results-based management and new public management approaches. And turn the idea of accountability around. If people are choosing to manage using systems where the evidence says this does not work, hold them accountable for it. Hold people accountable for the choice of choosing to manage in a paradigm that doesn't work. Um, and what the alternative uh, looks like, or an alternative looks like, is saying, and I think this is particular, might be particularly interesting to innovation folk is you can apply innovation processes to the strategies and practices of management itself. Right? And if you do that, what you get is and work that through is that you get an alternative public management paradigm. Thanks very much indeed. I hope that was useful as a framing for our conversation today. Thank you, Toby. Uh, I thought that was that was very useful and I don't know if it, Zoom calls, you can't clap. Uh, I guess you can with the emojis. I'm breathing the same 
kind of, you know, sentiment. But anyway, I'm giving you a sort of virtual clap certainly for the, for that, and and, and I appreciate also you set, setting up as a bit of a provocation as well. I think you, you know, given it, it's actually a deliberate choice that we are currently sitting in, and and who is then responsible for that choice and and the consequences of that to uh, get a bit of a reflection opportunity uh, on that, Toby. Uh, I'm going to let Gina and Penny comment their immediate thoughts to what you just shared with us. Gina? Thanks. Thanks, Jesper. Toby, that was that was, that was was awesome. I feel uh, like my one word answer is just amen to all of it. I mean, it's, um, I feel it. Uh, it feels good to hear it's impossible. It feels good to hear it's broken and we don't have to accept it. Um, and I'm really excited about this framing that learning becomes the management strategy. Um, I think uh, we've got a lot of people uh, online here from the UN Development Program, and particularly some of the labs in Indonesia and Serbia um, and India. Um, uh, but this is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, so, so right on and more to come on that. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Toby. Um, I'm always appreciative of your framing and succinctness of putting into words the stuff that we've been grappling with. So um, done that again, thank you. Um, just in terms of like off the top of my head, um, I think, yeah, the, the, the logic of it when we talk about it in terms of learning as a management system makes sense. And there's definitely pockets of it in practice. And then I still, I still hold the, um, which we can get into more today, right? that reality of sitting down with senior public servants and saying, we need to stop the train going so fast in that direction so that we can get off this platform and have a conversation about learning. And the, the velocity of that train is phenomenal. So how do we like run alongside the train? There's a, there's a bunch of things to do to create the oxygen for that stuff. So that reality is always with me as well. Like the two things of like, yes, totally, we can do this. And I know what these conversations feel like. I also really appreciate from our perspective, the journey that we've been on um, as an innovation lab, and now we don't want to do innovation anymore. We want to do the boring machinery of government. And we're trying to bring what, what was innovation projects or can we do something innovative with you, which means we're looking for a silver bullet for something, which of course doesn't exist, to say we're not doing projects anymore. We're not doing innovation stuff. It's not innovation on the edge. It's about the boring machinery of government. That's where the innovation and the unlearning is. And so the framing of it as innovation practice in government is useful in that sense. So yeah, that's just my off the top response. So thank you. And so this is essentially the first part uh, the wrap up of the first part, uh, sort of let's say the reframing element, where the second part, where Gina's Penny is going to kick us off, will be more around, let's say, exemplifying possible future practice um, and, and providing alternatives. Um, but for now, uh, yeah, please share the, the questions uh, and we'll attempt to pick them up uh, in the conversation. And what I'll suggest uh, to the panel, Toby, Penny, Gina. Um, Pick something that you think is most interesting or to talk about. We'll do it that way, sort of a simpler uh, format. There was obviously so many things. So, so the, th the stuff we're not going to talk about now, we'll try to pick up uh, later on. There, there seems to be a bit of a theme in the question so far. That, yeah. that, that's a kind of how do you transition from one to the other? Yeah, uh, yeah we did so talk that about saw, that as well. That, that I saw in a yeah. couple of questions. I don't know whether you would like yeah, well, to. Let's, let's start there. Toby, do you want to kick up? Yeah, and so what we've seen by by working alongside 40, 50 different organizations that are actually do like have actually made this change or in the process of making this change is that um, kind of experimentation and learning is the method for change as well as the change that you were trying to get to. So the, there's a kind of meta approach to this. So the um, essentially what we've seen is people who are trying to purposefully make this shift to an alternative public management approach, what they do is that they carve out as big a permission space as they can for running an experiment in doing public management differently. And that the permission space can be as small as the permission that I have in my work to do things differently. So it can be a one person permission space and um, because everyone has some kind of um, uh, choice about how they do the thing they do, right? So, but. The, the essentially the more people the w w what we've found is kind of uh the cycle of this is if you're dissatisfied with how public management works in your, your organization or your system there are other people who are also dissatisfied 
So you can do various things like write, write and publish things or put events on that, that draw out of the woodwork who else is dissatisfied with the way things are doing. And that gives you your um, set of actors who uh, want to experiment with doing things differently. And so what people have done is create the largest set of permission space they can to, to, to experiment with doing public management differently. And then they, they run that as an experiment as a change process. And so it is, a pl as I was saying before, it is this process of experimentation that becomes the method for change, as well as what you are trying to change to. Thanks, thanks, Toby. Uh, so I'm curious a little bit just to follow that in terms of the permission space, and maybe I'll hand it to Gina for, for that. Uh, obviously, the Accelerator Labs provides its own potential permission space in terms of trying out new, new um, ways of managing and measuring. Uh, and, and so on. Um, is there anything more we can say about the character characteristics of that permission space? What does it need? What is it? Um, what are the conditions for it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Gina, do, do you want to share some of your experiences? Sure, sure. And I really like that framing, carving out a space to experiment. Um, I think uh, we were able to do so uh, with some um, with some pretty. Um, risk averse, but kind of game for change uh, investors, um, the Qatar Fund for Development and the Federal Republic of Germany um, were ready for something new. Um, I think if you involve your stakeholders from the beginning and sort of saying like, we don't know, do you know, you know, let's figure this out together, um, then you do expand that uh, permission space for sure. It, I would say though, it's, um, it's not a lifetime guarantee, uh, you know, we were able to do it uh, by saying this is a three year thing. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to be fumbling around, you know, in the dark forever. We're going to figure something out in three years, which, of course, then leads you to the problem that innovation labs have, which is that it's very hard, you know, to look at the life cycle in three years and actually accomplish something when actually what you really need are a permanent function for research and development and exploration. Um, so it kind of buys you, what we did is we bought ourselves some time um, and now you, we, we need to see what is the value created um, by this network of social innovations labs that we have inside the UN. What do we do with that? How do we frame that as the next permission space? I think you only get it for so long. Um, if you think about, you know, if you want a 10, 15 year permission space to really create impact, I mean, I'd love to know how to do that. Um, I've not seen, I, I don't know how to do that, but but what we were able to do is to say, you know, um, this is like, this is like a shot of steroids. We're just gonna, you know, focus on it for now. And it's, you know, it's a sprint, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a short run thing when we actually know what we need is the long-term continuous capability for R&D. Gina, Penny, do you, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I would agree with Gina in the sense of um, it's um, it's not a lifetime guarantee. So um, those permission spaces open and close uh, for sure. Um, I think when I'm just think, looking at some of the questions about transition and how do you, because I think there's sort of big versions and little versions. And one of those questions about what about when people don't understand what this is or um, don't kind of know where to start or recognize it. And some of the places that we've started are very small and just creating like literally that idea of um, spaces of oxygen where a different conversation happens. To me, that's that's like the very smallest unit of, of, of life is when um, within a public servant sector setting, there's a different kind of conversation, which might be a conversation about why um, or it might be a conversation about, is this actually the right thing? Because normally our act, we're very action focused. We're very, very focused on what we're doing. Um, and we're not so focused on how we're doing it or how what we're doing is connected to bigger questions of equity or sustainability. So the smallest space sometimes is just a conversation. And so just, and I know this can sound a bit fluffy, but the cultivation of reflective practice for people and those spaces to have those different kind of conversations. And as soon as people start having value returned to them of looking at different kinds of outcomes, like just paying attention to what was the difference about the way we approached that thing last week 
you know, we, we, we tried something different about how, how we talked to someone or what we did or the questions that we asked and people start to see that influence positively on their work, that idea of shifting the evaluative questioning and practice into the, into the actual every day, um, as opposed to saying we do something and then we evaluate it at the end. Those are just some small entry ways that we've found. Um, and then there's more and more oxygen because people are getting benefit out of a different kind of conversation. And then there's a sort of balance to be had between the doing and the um, reflecting on that action and understanding it and, and kind of creating the muscles for both of those things. Yeah. Thank you, Fanny. I, I like the sort of metaphors around the body and the oxygen and the, the muscles and so on. I think that sort of paints a, a really useful picture. Um, uh, so I'm mindful of, of time, but I've, we have time for a quick other question. Toby, Gina, did you notice anything to chat that you thought stood out as something you want to comment on? I was sort of taken a little bit by the, the question from Jeff around values and value propositions. Uh, it sort of relates to uh, um, uh, conversations we've certainly been having, Penny, uh, from your work. Uh, I think some of the power of your work is that it's, it's deeply grounded in, in a particular value set that is sort of defined uh, from, the, from the start, so essentially, obviously going back to indigenous uh, principles and, and so on. It, I wonder, um, and maybe this is sort of a slight different take on your question, Jeff, so apologies, uh, but I wonder how important that is uh, to what we're dealing with here. Like, do we need to become explicitly value-based in order to shift the paradigm in terms of the measuring practice? Or, um, uh, because it's, that seemed to be a, a sort of how some people see it, can we sort of, in a neutral way, just establish new indicators, and that will sort of take us to the promised land. Uh, Toby. So I think the, the, the values-based stuff is really important because you can't justify some, you can't justify a set of practice whether all the way down. Mm. You have to assert a starting point. These are the values that uh, this practice relates to. So when we're talking about, when we're developing the, human learning systems as an alternative public management paradigm what what we found from looking across all the different um uh organizations working in this way was this idea that the rooting the practice in the value of we think that public service the point of public service is to promote human freedom and flourishing anyone who also thinks that like that this is for you if you don't think that human, the purpose of public service is to promote human freedom and flourishing, this probably isn't a public management paradigm for you. But that, uh, so we, could, we, we started the, we were able to kind of justify and reference, this is why we do it like this, because we believe that. And that I think was a quite a useful um, grounding point for us. So I see the point in that values thing, in kind of, um, asserting that kind of value proposition, but the to bring back to bring back in Jeff's perspective, the if you were going to enable learning across people who have different sets, different starting points for that, then one of the things that you need to do is put your values on the table and go, what do we think, and make those the subject for kind of reflection and um, discourse themselves. So the critical social learning system stuff. Maybe I can just ask a question too, Jesper, and that is, I posted it and, and maybe we can answer it later if we, if we want to go into the break. But it is interesting to me that um, we cannot uh, think of the, the change and the paradigm shift in the public sector as separate from a paradigm shift in a larger society. Um, and that has to um, then also, that there's a bit of a danger when we when we focus too much on the development and the efforts inside the public organizations and, and always make it a burden on the public sector to become better and uh, uh, more, you know, adapt and, and innovative and more learning and all that. But then we feed into the public sector the very same kind of people with the very same kind of training that we've had them for the last 50, 60 years. Um, so we need to we need to also broaden that conversation. And I actually post posted it, I was wondering how in your work um, you can may be able to connect into this broader societal uh, shift, you know, maybe learning institution, because it is about learning, 
um, that that would start to address it. We don't have a solution. I'm fully aware of that. But where are we with that? Who wants to uh, do a quick reply on that? Penny, looking at you. I'm stuck on the values. Sorry, I'm still yeah, on values. I, I know. But you, you get a chance. I know you will <laughs> share stuff on that uh, in your presentation. So let's save that. I'll let Dana go. Okay. Can I talk about values? <laughs> okay. I didn't, didn't mean to draw that. away from the values. I just thought right. that they need to go outside of the, you know, one thing. Right. So let's let's let keep that question, Sabina, then for 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 the later discussion. Um, if you want to have a go on values, Gina, go for it, and then. No, I Dana. I just want yeah, just it resonated with me because one of the things, uh, you know, <laughs> the the designers behind. Uh, this uh, network of social innovation labs that we call the accelerator lab network put together a lot of innovation methods um, in one go and one of the principles they wanted to promote was this idea that we're missing local knowledge frugal innovation the knowledge and practices of people we're actually trying to serve um, and that was kind of a value statement put out there from the beginning and actually led to um, what I, what many of us consider a major development, which is that we now have 91 people uh, around the world. Um, I, I think uh, Yulia, for example, in Indonesia is one of these people. We have we have other lab members uh, here whose job it is, full time job it is, to learn from communities. Um, and and just and setting that out as a value has been really uh, amazing. Sometimes when we sit back and we try then to go, okay, what are we getting from this? What's actually the change generated from this? Then it gets um, it gets harder to pinpoint, but the value is so strong and it just resonates with people, you know, our collaborators in Africa and across the world. This this idea, this empowerment that you know that that innovation comes in all forms and we just need to learn to see it. The value itself is so pop powerful that it's almost like the measurement becomes less important. Um, or there's less expectation, Sabina, on this public sector to like really spend the money properly and, and get it right and innovate out of problems that no one's been able to solve. Thank you. Um, Penny, you want to do a final comment before we break for a couple of minutes? Just your question about the the learning and institutes where it took me Sabine which is I'll just try and do this succinctly um at the at the real heart of the work in Aotearoa in New Zealand it doesn't matter what public sector issue we're grappling with we need to come to terms with colonization and different levels of identity and positionality in that and at the heart of competencies of 21st century public servants is that for us there's a whole lot of other great things that we can talk about too and really important skills, but actually, if we dig to the, the to the heart of what what learning and government looks like, and learning into a different kind of practice here, anyway, that's actually at the centre of it, and that's about identity, understanding a whole lot of things about who you are and your position in it, and that's actually the core competency because you have to be kind of brave and curious, particularly. Well, actually, it doesn't matter where you are in that story. So, yes, really, really important to think about. Um, the nature of how people are coming into public service institutions. But for us, that's actually at the center of what a new learning paradigm looks like, I think. Great. And a great way to end, let's say, part one of the session. Thanks. But now I'm very excited uh, to basically give the floor to Gina first and then Penny, who's going to share from their work in UNDP and in, in New Zealand. So I hope it's OK that I put you first there, Gina. I don't know if you're ready to uh, share your experience. So I'm looking forward to that and over to you. Cool. Thank you so much. And I just I just want to acknowledge the fact that, like, actually, uh, we've got a lot of uh, colleagues from my organization on the call um, from the I head up a global team that stewards um, a network of innovation labs inside the United Nations, but I'm joined here by by Bas Lurs, by by Mirko Evans, Hazer, by Eduardo Gustale, who are here with me on the global team, and then we've got uh, Rosita, who's from our lab in India. Uh, we've got Yasmina in in and Lazar in North Macedonia. We've got Yulia in, in Indonesia. Katuna, of course, like you know, renegade innovation vanguard in Georgia. 
And if I'm missing anyone, please let me know. But I just want to acknowledge colleagues that are at here as well. Drasko, Drasko, Head of Exploration in UNDP Serbia. So fantastic. I want to share with you kind of framing around three basic questions and then a bit about what we're trying to do about this in, in our work in that experiments experimentation space that we've been able to carve out to, to set up this network of innovation labs. So the three questions I want to focus on are what is success, uh, what is learning, and what is evidence? And then to give you a bit of an idea of what we're trying to do around measuring impact, some of that is still to come, um, and what we're trying to do around uh, learning. So when it comes to this question of what is success, I think, Toby, you really touched on this. So we don't need to go into it in depth, but you know, every time I look back at this framing of wicked problems from Rattel and Weber, I just get stuck on the upper left-hand corner of this circle of uh, characteristics of wicked problems, which I think are at this point, the majority of the problems we're addressing, certainly in the public sector, because either they've become you know, so entrenched, like something like averting climate disaster, that scarcity in rural areas causes urbanization and, you know, and flooding, um, you know, in cities. At this point, it's, it's really such a massive, wicked mess. But if you look at the two circles up the upper left hand side, where it's problems are never completely solved, and can take a really long time to evaluate solutions. This does all look very hopeful and really is, resonates with what Toby said, which is like, hey, actually, this is impossible. And so I think it's something we have to kind of keep in mind. So what we've done, and this is thanks, I have to say to, to Boss, who's, who's on the call, um, is kind of really simplify our theory of change. Um, I have to say, I didn't want to use it at first in the narrative because I thought it was too simple, but, but I came around in the end. What we tried to do is basically build a social innovation uh, expertise, bring in data scientists, ethnographers, designers, entrepreneurs, you know, kind of misfits of many forms into the UN by setting up these labs in 91 countries around the world. They are national staff of those countries. So they bring the context as well. Uh, many of them are coming back from working or studying abroad. Um, so they're highly skilled and kind of coming back to head up exploration and experimentation in the United Nations back in their home country. So we're strengthening our capabilities. This is a way we adapt to constant change we see on the outside, which is faster than we can move. And the whole point of all of this is to accelerate learning, right? So that's that we carved a space for experimentation by being humble and saying, hey, we don't actually know the solutions. There this best practice idea that we can uh, with our global presence as a 17,000 person organization, uh, the UN Development Program with a $5 billion a year budget that, you know, we got it sorted and we can just, you know, share good practices from country to country. We're acknowledging here that actually what those, the complexity of problems need right now is experimentation and learning. And we made that kind of the point. When it comes to what is learning, there was in the chat some reference, of course, to Donella Meadows and, and systems thinking a primer. I love this quote that she puts uh, at the beginning of one of the chapters in that book, which is from a poet uh, and farmer. Um, the acquisition of knowledge always involves the relevation of ignorance. So it's almost as if when you realize you're ignorant, that you're actually acquiring knowledge. Um, and this really speaks to me when it comes to learning, because it is about that wicked problem dynamic, right? Where you make it two steps and then you realize, wow, I know nothing about uh, all of these other dynamics. Um, and that's a hard thing to reveal for accountability purposes when you're dealing with, you're a steward of public funds, right? That, that you didn't know what you were doing in the beginning, that you learned a lot along the way. Um, and this is really tough. So when we set up this network of many, 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 some might say too many labs, um, we didn't just want to be a franchise, we actually wanted to become a learning network, meaning that something about the continuity and coherence of the methods these labs use and the language they all speak, um, innovation speak wise, would accelerate this pace of learning um, faster than, than, than what was underway and, and would kind of create some, some breakthroughs. So what we're trying to do there is basically to say, yes, public management needs reinvention, measuring impact needs reinvention, but so does knowledge management, and especially as it relates to learning. So what we found are 
you know, it's very common to kind of have a set of predefined buckets and taxonomies where you say, okay, all the governments have agreed to 17 sustainable development goals, uh, 169 targets, let us now understand what the work is underway in those areas. And this blocks your vision because you can't see what doesn't fit into those bu buckets. We've also learned that the best knowledge is in context and is tacit, which is really tricky to deal with because getting tacit knowledge out of people's heads um, is tough. Um, and also questionable ethically as to how much you should do it and whether you're doing it you know, for extraction and, and does taking that knowledge out of context immediately ruin it and make it irrelevant or, or um, you know, a colonization factor. Um, th there's a lot of ethics around that and questions around that. But basically what we're trying to use are um, data science, I'll talk more about this in a moment, um, and kind of all of this unstructured chatter of the, the lab network of labs we have to find patterns in what is emerging across our network. Some of the team and I have written about this in a couple of blogs um, on the Accelerator Labs uh, Medium channel if you want to check that out. Um, so lastly, what is evidence? So, I mean, especially with complex problems and if you take a kind of approach that nothing we can do will necessarily avert a climate catastrophe, but what we can do is create evidence which will help the decision makers make better, you know, more, uh, future informed decisions to actually make a dent in this. So evidence-based policy becomes, you know, a target kind of in itself. What we've been working with is kind of redefining what evidence is, right? Here's a nod to, to, to Robert Putnam and whose who's reality count, Robert Chambers, excuse me, whose evidence counts, right? So by bringing in experiential knowledge, experimental knowledge, ethnographic evidence, we've started to kind of see a shift in our own organization where senior management realizes that some of the policy failures, some of the development failures are due in part to missing out on the knowledge of and practices of, of communities, um, that there's a distance there and that has to be overcome. That being said, it's not like we're greeted with open arms in every moment because when you're looking at a big complex problem like many of the teams in Africa are looking at the free trade agreement and how to make that work, the focus is immediately on big multinationals and formal trade across borders. When, when, our, when our labs come in and say, hey, there's all this small scale trading going on, the COVID-19 has really closed down the borders and now there's increased uh, uh, corruption payments that have to happen, which means that it's exacerbated the cost of living, you know, just crossing borders for these communities in ben Benin and Togo and Ghana that don't see those borders as real. When you come in with that kind of small scale, you know, we've got women entrepreneurs making Shia butter and, and other things, it's, it's met with some resistance because there's a focus on scale and impact, right? And so you come in with the small and they go, meh, and, and, and you kind of have to deal with that. So what we're trying out is first to just admit that what we're doing is different, right? Um, um, what's different with what we do, and this is how we explain it internally, is that there seems to be in the default a lot of focus on the planning uh, you know, we tend to make five-year plans that take two years to negotiate, and they're based on, you know, five to 10-year-old data is kind of the extreme of this dynamic. And then the reflection and learning comes in as a, a reporting moment, an accountability moment, um, rather than kind of an opportunity for real reflection. And this is where Caroline's question in the chat and Maika's conversation talked about the emphasis in the public sector is just on... Uh, doing what you said you would do, right? It doesn't matter if it worked, just, you know, that is a principle of, of stewarding public funds, right? Politicians need to tell us what they're gonna do and do it. And whether it works or not is kind of less important. What we're trying to do is kind of cut the planning, run to the action and build in the reflection through learning cycles in, in the course of that. And then focus on the, 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 the learning learning from what doesn't work, which means it's still a success in terms of public money spent uh, because we learned something um, and then growing whatever, whatever does seem to work. We're also trying to kind of, and don't yet know how to do this, but we're trying to at least acknowledge that traditional, um, the traditional modality where you say, 
uh, here's the problem, here's how my intervention is going to make an indent on that. And you will know by looking at these indicators, we're trying to open that up to bring in kind of, you know, multiple futures thinking and think, um, uh, you know, actually, here's the problem, here's my intervention here's a few things that could happen. Um, two of these are good, one's not, you know, um, let's work with that. And this is something that we'll be working um, with Jesper and James on, and um, my colleague Eduardo is on the call. This is kind of what Jesper was referring to with um, testing out some new methods. So we might, we might test this out as one of our methods to look at multiple futures there. We're also building on the States of Change um, cultural impact framework to say, yes, you can count the reports and the projects and the launch events um, and the innovation products, but can you move on to get to that, um, this kind of how decisions are made, you know, what are, the, what changes beyond the outputs um, in question, right? What are the stories? What are the advocacy? And more importantly, what's the indirect value creation, the stuff you couldn't have predicted, the stuff that's a bit ambiguous, the stuff that happens outside, um, outside what you even planned or imagined. Um, the life is what happens when you're making other plans uh, reference here. Um, but we do kind of have to like say what success looks like. And so this is sort of our management cheat sheet. Um, basically, because we have, uh, you know, almost 100 labs doing whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it, however they want to do it. But we uh, have to sort of go to our funders and say, here's what's happening. Here's what you're getting for your money. Um, we put a premium on just you know, using diversification as a hedge against uncertainty, that's the value we're saying we're creating. So we're saying we diversify how we understand problems by bringing in new data sources, and we diversify how we even understand solutions by bringing in new sources of expertise here, the experiential knowledge, ethnographic evidence, et cetera. And just the diversification, there's what you're getting for your money. Um, we know as well that you know, these labs exist inside a broader organization, and a lot of their value is about expanding and deepening and connecting what the organization is already doing, uh, what UNDP's portfolio already is. Uh, we know that just, just the prototyping um, can be a way of embedding and spreading uh, that practice um, into development. So I was talking to the team in Togo the other day, and they, uh, earlier in 2020, they did some work around tapping into radio call-in shows to understand what people think about the government's response to COVID-19. And, you know, we usually go to them and we're like, what was the result of that? You know, what happened? You know, what changed? And it's tough when it's a prototype to say, here's the big change that, that happened. But what has happened is that another team uh, has picked up that work and has said, you know what, we need to know about women's roles in the peacekeeping process in northern Togo. Can we use that radio uh, call-in show method as a way of gathering data on it? So we start to see this spreading of the use of it. We try not to have the labs just do things that are fun and interesting and novel for the sake of it, but target somebody's decision making. Um, I was always inspired by, uh, you know, our director for strategic innovation, Julio Quajoto's question to me many years ago when he said, okay, Gina, when you get that data, who are you going to call? What are you going to ask them to do? Um, and that always stuck in my head as a very practical thing. It's very hard to measure how anyone's decisions had made, whether it's a minister or, or, or anyone else um, that you're working with. Who knows what's going on in their head? We'll never know. Um, but just setting it as an intent kind of sends a signal, um, which is positive. Um, and then finally, we know that our labs are inside a bigger organization of the UN Development Program. And UN Development Program is in a bigger innovation ecosystem, which is changing, burgeoning, and growing all the time. So, so much of our work is, is um, tapping into that, elevating that, legitimizing that. Uh, because one of the assets we have as a United Nations organization is, is that legitimacy, right? So when we say, hey, you know, the startups in Zimbabwe are not just opposition groups hanging out in internet cafes, they're actually trying to solve problems. Government partners tend to listen to us because, you know, we're, we're the, we, we have a certain legitimacy in terms of having helped them with their constitution or their election or, you know, serious business. 
Then finally, just a word on what we're doing on learning, um, and then I'll close out. Um, so we're working on uh, this, what we're calling a network learning prototype, where we're trying to uh, take this massively uh, distributed intelligence that we have in this network of labs um, and kind of glean from it what we can without directing it, without managing it, without controlling it. Um, what we figured out is that we're kind of uh, like what kind of knowledge we're creating, um, which is a start. Um, so starting here um, at the top here, we know that we're getting a lot of knowledge on kind of like how to innovation method, right? X, Y, Z. So we've got a lot of labs using um, gamification, let's say to get the word out on COVID-19 um, from Capo Verde to Morocco to India. Um, you know, what are they learning about that question, right? And that method. Um, moving clockwise around here to look at the green, we know that we're picking up a lot of knowledge about weak signals, about context, about what sustainable development is in the modern age. Um, and, and that's also some knowledge that we're creating. Really important, and we need to do better at this, the results of the experiments um, we need to capture because the whole dream is always, you can do an experiment in one place and then a lab, you know, a team can pick up on what was learned there to design a better experiment in another place. Um, that one we're, we're working on, but struggling with. Um, and then finally, um, in this quest to get closer to communities, we're trying to uh, map and codify and build on and legitimize the kind of knowledge and practices and actually um, see grassroots innovations, not as a panacea or a unicorn that needs to be like accelerated and scaled and commercialized, but really as an indication of the needs that are not met neither by the available market nor uh, public services. And this is something we get from um, Professor Anand Gupta at the Honeybee Network. He always frames it as you're looking for the unmet needs. Um, and, and that's why you're looking at frugal innovation. Um, it's not necessarily to scale it. So we're working on this network learning prototype, which is, a, of course, a work in, 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 in process. Um, we're trying to figure out the roles between humans and machines here. Um, and so what we're doing is, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom, let everybody do what they want to do, put the emphasis on public reflection. And we're working mainly with text here. So written reflections, um, weekly reflections, public blogs, uh, we have a very active set of WhatsApp channels uh, that are that are underway. We try and kind of centralize that chatter, structure that chatter, and then the humans uh, read those for patterns um, and try and identify emerging heuristics that apply across countries. Um, and then we try and capture that um, in some form. So kind of the way it looks is that the labs reflect in their free text. The machines help us find the signpost of where to look. The humans read for patterns and identify learning questions that 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 um, that are generated through learning cycles. We bring together circles or campfires to kind of dig up that tacit knowledge, and then we try and match what we're getting from experiential and experimental knowledge with the state of the art um, in the field, because uh, we know we have blind spots, um, and we might think, you know. Uh, that, you know, pay as you go solar is a major discovery because we're seeing it as an emerging trend in Sudan. But actually, um, you know, those who've been in the field have been trying to do this for years and they know already the limitations um, that, that we don't know. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. So right now we're working on, um, here we go, uh, our, uh, we're, we're testing out this network learning prototype on uh, a specific question that has emerged over the lab network. We've seen that whether one of our labs works on youth employment or circular economy or COVID response, informality seems to be this kind of common theme and it's actually a feature, not a bug. Um, so much of economies is actually informal and unseen and possibly so much contribution to equity and sustainability is also happening in that space. So we're trying to test out this network learning prototype where we um, where we structure the chatter that we see across the network um, by looking at this question of informality. Um, and so this is basically, you know, where we are and, and what I wanted to share. Thanks, Jesper. Thank you, uh, Gina. That was uh, 
was a fascinating uh, perspective into uh, attempts to, I guess, reshape international development from, uh, well, in a, in a range of different ways, really. Uh, so I'm looking forward to talking more about that uh, in the discussion uh, and also letting people reflect in their own groups uh, in a second. Uh, but we have a very important other intervention that we want to hear from Penny. Uh, so it's over to you, um, and you're going to be sharing work from the Auckland Co-Design Lab um, around radical mission and redesign and how you've been approaching that. So, uh, so, so yeah, we'll, we'll hear from you, and then we'll get a chance to re collectively reflect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dina. Lots of crossover, even though your scale is the whole world and our scale is Aotearoa and in a place within that. Um, but I really appreciated that. Thank you. So yeah, so um, kia ora koutou. Um, I am Penny, I'm Pakia, which means I am I'm from Aotearoa, but my um, descendants are European. Um, and the uh, site where I sit on in Tamaki Makaurau in Auckland um, is, uh, is the home to multiple different um, iwi or tribes that um, connect to this um, whenua. Um, the team that I'm part of is, is in South Auckland um, and our, our kind of primary goal is equity and intergenerational wellbeing. We operate as a, as a kind of platform with our feet firmly in the ground um, in South Auckland with lots of the folks on my team that I work with come from that community. We're resident inside local government, but also um, partner with central government. So we kind of sit um, on multiple levels, as big as you can get in, in Aotearoa anyway, of our scale of um, different levels of government. And if we kind of, if in, a, in a nutshell, there's lots of different um, ways we could talk about it, but in a nutshell, uh, you know, what we're trying to achieve is prosperous, resilient, South and West Auckland where families and children thrive and they're leading in that civic innovation. And so the places that we operate across are social, economic, environmental, cultural, um, all the things that um, influence outcomes for people. It's definitely place-based, it's absolutely culturally grounded and it's definitely values led. Um, so just to connect into our conversation before, the, I'm just drawing on the socio-ecological model as a kind of cheap way to, to just really emphasize that if, um, families are thriving it's because there's a healthy ecosystem that sits around them and there's so many things that can contribute to that from our networks our families um, the institutions the environment policy um, settings etc and being able to activate all of those as a as a um, well-being ecology is is the potential that we see um, knowing that um, there's a sort of um, historic system here, particularly um, in New Zealand around colonization, structural racism, that means this ecosystem has historically been harmful. Um, and in some cases, the ecosystem now is, is enhancing the capacities and strengths that already exist for people. And in some cases, it's continuing to compound that inequity. So just understanding the potential of that system and how government locate, is located within that as an enabler or um, potentially um, still kind of complicit in compounding inequity. Um, so there's a real amazing richness in our ecosystem to, to um, mirror what Jean is talking about in terms of local innovation and capacity, particularly indigenous led innovation and capacity that's not historically recognized within the current um, governmental system. Um, but that doesn't mean that it can't be activated and that it doesn't exist. So um, we think about our work as, as as kind of working, modeling, experimenting with government around what it means to reconfigure around the capacities of people in place. So not just the big circles, but the circles connected into a particular place, which has a particular history. We can um, acknowledge and grapple with that history whilst also thinking about um, present and future. So we want to think system, but we need to think system in terms of located into place. And so that locality dialogue that Gina was sharing is really critical to us as well. And how do we, so our, our, um, our focus is experimenting on what that looks like when that ecology recognizes a much broader set of um, joyfulness, if you like, than what we see through our typical social service responses or crisis responses from government, where we package up things that fix people and kind of send them out and then count them, see how many people turned up, assess them. In actual fact, there's a much richer ecology, cultural, natural, environmental that could be supported. And so what does it look like to do that? Um, and to organize ourselves around what families say matter and make the difference to them. 
So that's a fairly radical shift in government trying to do that though. Um, that's a, a, a reasonably significant sharing of power, um, even to think about how we connect up and down between those different levels. Um, it's, it's definitely different ways of working, learning, accounting for value, saying whether something was successful or not. Um, and those ideas of how we use indicators and measures and tracking are actually really fundamental to ho holding the status quo in place. And a lot of our energy goes into reporting and compliance that is almost redundant energy. When you follow where some of those things go, not only do they not um, assess the things that make the difference, they're not informing anything either. So there's a you know, really significant habitual kind of pattern that we've developed, which um, Toby's called out um, really effectively in the human learning systems. So I'm just gonna share some of the things that we're um, growing, trying, experimenting with as a way to sort of work with that um, shift and learn what that looks like. And I just wanna um, acknowledge my fantastic colleague, Jeff Stone, who's on the line here, who was, was a very early um, a collaborator in this journey of understanding how we rethink what value looks like and um, track things around systems change. So one of the things that's, um, that we're using, I guess, as a, as a learning process ourselves is what it looks like to have a culturally connected learning system that is our guide for what navigating in complexity looks like. So if we can operate in a way that's much more responsive to the complexity of people's lives, the thing that I think is um, really interesting for us to, I guess, remind ourselves all the time is that government can't handle complexity, but communities can. Families that have experienced significant um, pressure, stress, the, the, that bear the brunt of inequity are extremely good at managing complexity. They do it every day. And so somehow bringing that complexity capacity and integrity into the system and, and closing that gap there is, is kind of part of the story. This learning system, one of the things that's most significant for us, it helps us build practice-based evidence. So we have a similar Venn diagram to what you showed Gina in terms of the type of knowledge that it produces. What's, what's really critical is that it starts with values. So the base of the system is about declaring values explicitly. What's the cultural paradigm that connects you? Because that's the definition of rigor. So rigor isn't associated with a particular methodology. It depends on the paradigm and the cultural context. And that's what tells us what good looks like and what, what, you know, working in a way that's true to um, the cultural context looks like. It's one of the other things that it does is really intentionally call out systems outcomes that we're seeing or systems changes or shifts that are occurring as we work, as well as what's happening positively or not for families and communities, because there's so much habit of government to only ever look at the outcomes of others and never look at their own, you know, at our own change patterns. So there's a deliberate kind of making visible of what's happening in the system as outcomes and changes just as much as for families and the strategic learning associated with that. And it draws on multiple forms of evidence. So we just summarized that really um, bluntly. Um, as lived experience, indigenous knowledge systems and Western knowledge systems and wanting to see the diversity across those. So that's one of the kind of ways that we're navigating through, through the learning process. Um, that lends itself to understanding what localized indicators look like. So um, looking at what might conventionally be said in, a, in say a setting of um, child wellbeing, early child development, what, what should be a good set of indicators for positive child development and child wellbeing. And then actually examining those, rejigging them, challenging them, working with families on the ground and testing stuff out to see what that actually looks like. So it might look like a sequence like this, not necessarily in this order where you say, well, what does, what do our current systems tell us good measures are? What does the health system think good measures are? What does the education system think good looks like for child wellbeing at the, in the early years? Then understanding that um, through an indigenous lens, or maybe that's where you start, and they'll be radically different things already, right, around what good looks like. Um, understanding from the perspective of families, when that when things are going well for them, and they get to um, be in a place where they can create the thriving environment that they want to have for their children, what does success look like for them? It's not services. It's very rarely any of the things that we assess, but it'll be things like being confident, being affirmed culturally, being able to lead, being able to connect. Those are the kinds of things that give them the capacity to nurture their children the way they want to. So what does that look like as a set of indicators for child wellbeing services or environments or policies? Um, one of the key, this has come up already a few times, this idea of evidence, what actually is it, who gets to say, what are we paying attention to? So this is just an example of 
the kind of um, conversation that we'll have with um, policymakers and public service teams to say, let's actually examine where your outcomes and indicators come from now. Whose value system do they reflect? And so you and I have had this conversation before. Um, just yes, but there's there's no such thing as a neutral set of values or neutral indicators. And if we think they're neutral, then they're probably white. Like that's where they come from usually as the dominant paradigm. So we pretend that there's no values and that these are critical objective, but they're not. They're fully embedded um, in an ideology. So getting people to just even cultivate a criticality around where did they come from and who do they represent and who said they mattered. What would it look like if we drew from some of these other sources, which absolutely includes um, lived experience and family's perspectives and so on, and how might we then reshape some of our ways of working, including um, health services, early years services, you know, education around some of these things that actually mirror much more closely to what people say matters to them. And so those are some of the conversations that are being able to be had actually here at the moment because we have a major health reform taking place and there's a real interest in understanding what does it look like then if the indicators serve much more closely to families. Just a couple more things. Um, this is, so the other thing I talked about, like learning systems, um, localizing indicators. One of the things that we're doing is using tools that help us start in different places and have different conversations. In this particular model, it's very simple, um, but it has a lot of depth behind it. It's a, developed out of the practice-based evidence, but it's just a reframing. At the minimum, it's a reframing of a conversation with public service teams about what their job is and what the capacity is for community to respond to issues um, in their own way, not as services, but not just that. All our money at the moment, almost 98% of our investment goes in the responding category. It goes into crisis response largely. Almost none of it goes into healing and strengthening. Um, and this, is, this particular model is a replacement from our perspective of the primary prevention model or prevention continuum of prevention, intervention, crisis intervention which doesn't make sense in the context of the complexity that we're working in. And it's also not what people want. Um, and to take a more intergenerational um, well-being perspective, healing and strengthening is actually where we, need, where we need to be also from a climate perspective. And these kinds of models just make clear what our investment strategies are now, but they also prompt us to think about what are the different sets of indicators then if we're not tracking crisis response, we're tracking how effectively the environment enables strengthening or healing, for example. So those kinds of tools and conversations are helping us to shift thinking about what we might track, what we might invest in and how we might think about what matters. And so then the, the final summary then is the uh, sitting underneath that is what are the learning infrastructures that help us try those new things, get to those new places. Um, and we started that conversation before, how do we create the capacity for learning and the learning infrastructures up and down um, the system, move that idea of the innovation practice into BAU. And so we have a, a few different kind of, we're attempting different things. We're trying in different ways to cultivate what different learning infrastructures look like locally and regionally. One of the key parts of that is to help government think about what are the things and the changes we are responsible for instead of just monitoring the outcomes of others and saying, what did we get for our money? It's like, well, how did we create the conditions for that to be successful or not? What did we change? What did we think about in terms of our contracts, power sharing, IP, all those boring things that actually tie up um, the capacity for communities to be able to operate differently. Um, and we're our emphasis to the folks that we're working with is we just got to learn our way into this. This is not a wake up tomorrow and we've got transformation. So we're going to have to use the learning mechanisms to get us there. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Isabel. Thank you, Penny. Uh, and uh, thanks also Gina and, and Toby for, uh, for these sort of, sort of mind stretching perspectives. Uh, I think what we've been hearing uh, particularly, well, in all of th the three presentations are really kind of alternatives, concrete alternatives, uh, re reconfigurations, as you were calling them, Penny, um, both around, I mean, the systems themselves, whether that's knowledge management or, or whatever it is, um, but also around the indicators um, and the sort of, let's say, the change patterns, as you were talking about, Penny, uh, but also examples of formats and tools um, to actually, where, where do we start? Um, and I think that's one of the critical things right now is kind of to identify the, the, the entry point, if you will, into this. Um, so um, as all of you have been talking about, uh, you have a plan uh, until you don't have one uh, or until you're pressed for time. So let's, uh, let's shift the plan a little bit. We were supposed to send you into breakouts 
uh, that's probably going to be a little bit too hectic. Uh, so let's stay um, in the plenary um, and take uh, reflections, questions, uh, concerns, objections, whatever they might be. Um, and let's take them now. Um, feel free to share them in the chat. Uh, also, I think there's a function to put your hand up if you want to ask a question directly. Um, and then, then um, react. Right. Okay. Um, so maybe maybe in the chat, and we'll try to pick them up. Uh, maybe we can elaborate then as well on them. There are, of course, a lot of questions right now directly related to Penny's talk, though there will a lot also earlier in response to what Gina shared with us. So maybe we can just uh, quickly start with Rosita. Rosita, you asked, Penny, can you give examples of unlearning and infrastructure? Yeah, for sure. I mean, what I guess the conversation that we're often having with folks is that shift from this is not about silver bullets. If we're genuine about equity, that's not what we're doing here is de designing services. And it doesn't matter how good those are we've got to look at the heart of the um, structures that are holding the status quo in place. That's actually not innovation, it's unlearning. It's going back from the habits that you've been embedded in. It's unlearning the things that we think are important. It's unlearning the way that we think success is inside the public sector as a for career pro progression. So that when I say learning infrastructure, it's just as much about unlearning and unweaving. And if we don't do some of the going backwards and the unpacking, we can't do the reconfiguring. Um, so yeah, I just think that the infrastructures for learning are just as much about unlearning. And, and we just have to apologize that it's not that sexy. It's actually, it's not even new. Some of it's just getting rid of some of the baggage that we're carrying around about how we think you know, things need to be. So maybe it's simpler than, maybe I made it sound more interesting than it was. And Gina, are you still awake? <laughs> well, you do, you do all realize that Gina joined us as, as a very ungodly hour at like 4.30 in the morning, uh, New York time is when this session started. So um, really, I hope your coffee keeps coming. Um, I don't know if you found an interesting question in the chat yourself uh, that you want to respond to, or um, I, I have also one that I thought was uh, Angel Lamar, where uh, is asking about the network expansion within these labs. Are they used to? How are they used to justify the evolutionary logic behind them when take when talking with stakeholders? Can you clarify yeah. this question? It could be yeah. my. Uh, it could be the fact that I woke up at you know two o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's, yeah. It, it it just sounded really interesting, right? Because you you seem to have like this underlying logic, right? Of of expanding, diverse, diversifying, and then what doesn't work doesn't work. It's very evolutionary, so to speak, right? Um, and then mm -hmm. you, you, it seems that you're very free on like how people do their experiments and whatever. And I'm wondering if those nodes, right, that you're beginning to create and how that network is expanding is used as a way to say, hey, we're doing these things, we're connecting these people. And this is a way to get, uh, you know, things can really come out of this, maybe not now, but maybe a couple of years. So how is that quantitative uh, element of expanding the network used to justify the work that you're doing within the labs, if at all? I think to be completely honest, the context in which we're working is basically, we have a head of the UN development program, Akim Steiner, who came in and created space for this, like, uh, like nothing else I've ever seen. And that's why I jumped at the chance to to, to work with him and 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 make this happen um, and the you know there are many people behind designing it um, Milica Begovic and Julia Quadrotto and and Glenn Mann and many others who who kind of came in before I was plunked in to pop up this network um, I mean the so from the beginning this idea that you would do sixty labs at once was just insane right any normal person would be like do 20 learn from that you know do one do two do three you know um and then we uh, of course there was enormous pressure to do it very quickly um to have results and something to talk about even before there was something there um the decision to expand came largely because um once we had you know UNDP has about 120 country offices in developing countries so once you had half the presence with labs the question was why don't I have a lab you know from from other governments um and and also it was in the context of COVID-19 where um you know I have to say we we start we set up the network before uh the pandemic uh, in, in the you know the before times as it were 
Um, and in many moments, you know, we would talk about sense making and horizon scanning and, you know, collective intelligence. And people would look at us like, that's nice, honey. You know, we're dealing with the real problems of the world. And then COVID-19 hit and it was like, yeah, whatever that thing is that you do where you don't know what's going on, but you kind of get some sort of sense. Can you do more of that? We really got that like in a big way. Suddenly it was like, yeah, uh, please. Um, so so I think the expansion kind of happens in that context. Um, that's that's sort of how it how it goes. And and again, there is this um you know, there is this value in something which is presented as imperfect and messy and kind of like, I'm not sure who said it, but somebody said the, you know, three most powerful words uh, a policymaker can say are, I don't know. And just saying that kind of brings people in and then they want to be a part of it. So that means like we say, hey, we didn't really have it all figured out when we set up the first 60 labs, then we expanded to 91 and we kind of figured it out a little bit more. Um, but now we know, you know, all the things that we don't know. So that's kind of how it's been going. Can I just chime in here? Because you just really said something very important, uh, Gina pointed it out. And that is that we have um, become aware um, and, and have gained new competencies during that COVID crisis. And um, many people discovered competencies they had, many grew on them, many built them further up. And, and, and one of the questions also in the, in the stream uh, or in the, in the sense of this particular core competencies uh, stream would be also a question of like, how do we ensure, um, you know, first of all, what, what have we gained in terms of competencies and how can we ensure that we continue to build on them and not lose them? Because that is really one of the questions that uh, I know also Carolina and, and, and politics for tomorrow, we were struggling with this, like how are we making sure that we're not losing something? It's been shown that we can, it's, it's possibilities have been shown. Is there anything that you uh, in your environment and maybe not just Gina, maybe Toby and, and Penny or, or anyone in the audience, frankly, um, who has experience with that could comment on that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, first, I just wanna, uh, yeah, I, I do wanna flag something that Penny said, which I thought was something I really learned from, which is that, you know, one of the competencies of 21st century public servants um, is actually to, to decolonize the way they work. I think that's extremely important. And I think it's uh, something I'd like to learn more about um, and don't exactly know how to do. Um, for us, for competencies, I mean, Boss, I see you there. I don't know if you wanna come in on this. Uh, you're welcome to. Um, I think uh, we knew that this, you know, our theory of change was we're building up our competencies to adapt to change, to accelerate learning, because the, what the world needs now is love, sweet love, but it's also learning on, on, on how to get out of this mess. Um, and so we knew part of the value add was bringing in these competencies. The challenge we have is understanding which competencies are transferable and which are mindset driven and, and kind of how you distinguish that. So if you're saying, you know, we carved the experimentation space for a short amount of time, in a certain number of countries, which is a lot, but still not all of them. Um, the pressure on us is to mainstream what we're doing. And it's very hard, you know, Drasko, who's our head of exploration in Serbia can, can tell you, you can't take uh, uh, some of those skills and just transfer them, you know, to, to, to others, somebody who's not a data scientist, right? If you're not a data scientist, you can't make use of, um, you know, social media, mobile network, unstructured data, period. And maybe you could, you know, with some courses and whatever, uh, move from statistics to data science, obviously there's, there's a connection there, but um, some of the competencies are transferable and some of them are not. And some of them are really mindsets, which means that what you need to do is just get people in and get them to have the teachable moment where they experience the like moment of understanding their ignorance and then therefore, you know, they're learning. But just one quick comment on what Gina just said mm. about mindsets and all that stuff. I think with the accelerator labs, is what I see is um, because it is such kind of a large scale uh, experiment. Is there, there is this kind of these pace layers of change, and some of the change that we see happen took quite a while. And I think that the the, the size as well as the the duration of let's say the intervention so far as kind of, it was enough, the scale was big enough, uh, the time was long enough 
to actually demonstrate how it works and what it kind of value it delivers. So it, it was not kind of one of a, a small lab or a small experiment somewhere at the fringes of the organization. It's kind of throughout the entire organization. So, and I think that's kind of probably also something that was necessary uh, in, in our uh, in our case. But it's this this process of mindsets that's kind of changing and shifting them. That's kind of I think a very slow process. Yeah, thanks, Bess. Um, I just wanted to pick up, uh, and this was sort of relating to Charlotte's question in the chat as well uh, around. Uh, I think you sort of posed it to Penny around whether government employees understanding their place within the future system scales as you as you visualized it in the, in the diagram you shared. Uh, and for me, that there's a there's a sort of more general question there about, uh, and it sort of relates to your point, Toby, around choice um, as well as whether we have a uh, you know there's a deliberate choice there or kind of choosing the paradigm of measurement or management paradigm you're, you're in. Uh, I think. Uh, sort of certainly my experience is that uh, and I'm sort of getting that a little bit from both Penny and Gina's uh, presentations as well is you need to be well influencing those choices a little bit you need to be nudging your way in and you need to as Gina when you said you need to create those teachable moments uh, for the organizations to, uh, I mean, the employees to realize um, uh, you know that they, they should probably be part of this, uh, or at very least, um, to, again relating to Charlotte's question, um, how do you get government employees or executives or whoever it is to recognize themselves within the alternatives, or the alternative frameworks that you um, that you provide? Because I guess that's a bit of a premise for change as well, um, so we can all, you know, uh, you know. They might very well reflect the community's point of view, but the decision makers are not in on it, then what happens? So I'm, I'm sort of curious uh, on all of your views on, on that. Right? I'll just give a quick answer, which is yeah. from, from where we're sitting, that um, there's just almost unanimous understanding that what we've been doing isn't working. So there's just a massive readiness for different that doesn't mean we know so, so a different way of looking at stuff is very helpful and we but then we have to follow through on the how as well and that's where it, that the actual implementation level from you know when we're thinking whole of government is significant but the people are, are, are very in our experience at the moment very interested in things that help them to switch how they can see things and and reorganize stuff so there's a real willingness to to utilize lenses that help to to, to create new ways of thinking and new, new starting points literally as a heuristic for us like if it's not a new starting point stop because if you if it looks anything like what you've been doing before we ain't going anywhere different and that's across the board so it's like it's that blunt sorry toby i just wanted to reinforce that point because paradigm shift starts with dissonance so you're looking you're always looking for who in government already feels that dissonance and the Danella Meadows stuff is brilliant for this because it can save you a ton of time don't waste a single second on the skeptics because they're you can't kind of talk someone or evidence someone into paradigm shift it has to start with that sense of dissonance that things can be can and should be different and there are a ton of people in government who feel like that so work with them and then the other ones will follow when the stuff that you're doing with the, the, the people who feel the dissonance starts to work. Thank you. Um, let's speed through. We, we do have two questions that Sabina was highlighting. So Caroline and then Ardita, and then we'll have to wrap up after that. I think this is more to Gina and Bas, um, but also uh, Toby um, and others. The experiment that you're doing right now with the accelerator labs, I think for our whole community, it's crucial to understand how transnational organizations can actually learn from what you're doing right now and how that can become a kind of benchmark for transitioning into a new status quo on an organizational level. And my question would be, is there for you a plan to structure it in a way that let's say other transnational organizations can or could repeat it, could set up something similar? That's a question. Thank you. And Ardita? Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, I would like to point it out. Uh, actually, it's a question, but also a perspective that I've been looking at. 
Um, we have been discussing a lot about growth mindset, but on a personal level. And can we really talk about growth mindset at a collective level? And how this really relates into the freedom, but also the safety about failure during experimentation. Because if we are really going to learn and going to experiment, we have to be very comfortable with failure as well. Great. I think that, that's a great question to end on. So I'll, I'll let everyone kind of reflect on that. And, and also obviously speaking to, to uh, Caroline's input. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for, for the question. And I mean, I'm always I'm super humbled by the people who are kind of in this Zoom room already, because I think there's an enormous amount of knowledge here. And I don't think that uh, other than, you know, circumstance and, and good leadership, we've had, uh, you know, we have like a secret sauce here for, for reframing public organizations by any means. Um, there are a couple of things that might be helpful. One is um, an MIT Sloan article um, about our work and other work um, in this, um, which uh, which I can pop in the chat uh, kind of as we close this out. Um, Harvard Business School is also doing a case study on our work. Um, so that'll be something that's available. The midterm evaluation, um, you know, it, it has been worked on by Jesper and James, uh, among others, um, which is which is useful. And then most usefully, um, you know, do follow us on the blog. Uh, but, um, but, you know, we're happy to talk to you uh, about it. I mean, it's, that, it's not like we can give a blueprint. We can, we can tell you sort of where we found banana peels and where we found wind in our sails. Um, but the best thing to do is just sort of figure out kind of what you're starting with. And is there any, you know, is there anything we can share over a virtual coffee? Uh, we'd be happy to. I'll just share one comment because I know we're at time. Um, which is just coming to your final point there about failure. And one of the, this is a conversation I had this afternoon, which is co consistently a thought for us, is the distribution of risk, because government sees itself as taking risk around finances, but actually um, communities and families take risk all the time, particularly when they're under really significant pressure, and they bear huge amounts of risk of, of our other kinds of experiments. So I think a more sophisticated understanding of distribution of how um, taking of risk happens is is part of the um, puzzle for us. I guess, as you could expect with this sort of topic, uh, there's much more richness in this that we had time for. Uh, and uh, apologies to the questions we didn't get to. Um, I guess I could say just as a bit of a, a hopeful ending that we are, this is sort of a, in a way a, a part of a kickoff of, of a learning International Learning Collective. I know some of you uh, on this call are already part of that conversation uh, as a sort of an ongoing way of trying to share the practice and reflect on the practice of redesigning uh, impact. Um, so looking for, forward to continuing that conversation and we'll make sure to, to certainly follow up uh, with everyone that's that's interested. Uh, and and uh, so, so from that angle, um, and, and, and then, and then uh, as uh, Gina was saying, um, uh, you know, there's ongoing work, you know, experimentation happening right now also with, with the UNDP uh, and States of Change and, and other partners involved there. So, so yeah, stay tuned and, and watch the space for that as well. And um, and for me, just thank you for everyone for joining and then special thanks to the speakers for sharing these amazing experiences. Over to you, Sabine, to, uh, to wrap things up. Yeah, thanks so much. There's not that much left to say other than this was really an impressive panel. Uh, really, we could only you know, get the tip of the iceberg from all of you, really. Um, in some ways, it's always um, encouraging to hear that everyone else is kind of like honing in on the similar kind of issues and challenges. On the other hand, frankly, it's also a little bit frustrating <laughs> because it uh, means like we're not moving any, any, any much further, which is probably not exactly true, um, especially when we hear from Tina and Penny, uh, there are uh, steps forward. But we all know this is, a, um, you called it banana peels. And uh, what was the other one? Banana peels, uh, Gina and- uh, Wind in the sails. Wind in the sails, I love <laughs> To mix <that>. metaphors. <laughs> that I, I, I love that because I also work with pictures, verbal and, and, and real, and, and that just will stick with me. And, and yet, um, you know, we know uh, we have to bring, uh, this is a super like start, like you said, yes, before in a network. Um, but the, the, the challenge is, of course, always to widen the circle and to bring in more people and to um, um, make this accessible to others and to um, valid, 
validate this then in the minds of those uh, who are still doubtful. Um, but so thank you, everyone. Uh, we have to let you go <laughs> as much as we would like to spend time with you. Um, and uh, hopefully, yes, well, we can somehow organize a follow up as, as uh, a learning, an ongoing learning collective here. That would be great. So thanks, everyone, especially Tina, Toby and uh, Penny. And of course, yes, also.